right, so I'm just going to describe a little bit about our practice because um, we're not really an academic center. We're a private practice. We deal mostly with interventional oncology, um, a lot of venous disease, uh, venous ulcers, and pelvic congestion. And as everybody kind of knows, the, the biggest barrier to pelvic congestion getting treated is actually the diagnosis and it reaching you. Um, so I'm going to go through how we get that done, um, the concomitant issues that surround public congestion. Um, we do about 100, I do about 100 deep venous cases a month. Most of it is um, elect vein stenosis, public congestion, and uh, tumor related stuff. Um, everybody is going to wonder, you know, are all these cases actually public congestion? And I wanted to go through some of our satisfaction surveys. Every single patient receives a quality of life survey and we track them long term. Um, so, our data is pretty good, actually, um, with, with the satisfaction from this. Um, we screen a lot more for pelvic congestion than most people do, and we screen with transcutaneous duplex, believe it or not. And the vast majority of people with an adequate tech, you can actually get a pretty good image. <clears throat> Our satisfaction scores are relatively high at about six months. After that, they tend to drop a little bit. Does this confidence screen work a lot? So the, the biggest roadblocks to PCA, PCS um, patient identification are you know, the symptoms can be very, very vague depending on individual anatomy. It differs in every single patient. Um, it's very difficult to assess exactly what their symptoms are due for prior to mapping, and it can range anywhere from gluteal pain to back pain to leg pain, and they very, very often coexists with iliac vein compression syndrome. Um, I have zero um, CTVs or MRVs in this presentation because we never use them. I think you miss a lot of lesions when you use CTV and, and MRV. Um, a lot of compression that we, a lot of PCS that we notice um, does not come strictly from the gonadal, and it's been widely publicized that gonadal vein diameter and pelvic varicosities um, diameter don't really have a lot to do with the severity of pelvic congestion. Um, a lot of the congestion that we see comes from hypogastric collaterals, which are short diameter fat veins that you won't see really on a CT venogram. Um, you will see it on a venogram because it's a physiologic test. You'll actually get right down to it. You'll see the collaterals. You'll see the, the shunting. You'll see delayed washout. You'll see a lot of things that you'll miss on an MRV or CTV. So our, our methodology, methodology, methodology is to get the patient to the venogram, do the physiologic study. And actually, um, so our, our workup depends mostly on duplex and actually speaking to the patient and discussing with them their symptoms. So we have a fairly healthy referral base from GYNs. Um, from a lot of superficial vein practices that don't do deep venous work, and we have a lot of patients that way. Um, we have a questionnaire that screens them specifically for things that they will um, have associated with pelvic congestion, and then we just go straight to venogram from there. Um, okay. So this is typically, that's Andrew, the guy who was taking a video of this. <laughs> Sorry for that image. Um, as you can see, there's a huge defect on the venogram there, and all the reflux goes down into the pelvis. And there's two things I wanted to demonstrate with that. As most of the reflux will never make it to the common femoral vein because you'll be offloading through the hypogastric. So hypogastric reflux is one of the things we use as criteria. This is a typical um, pelvic congestion syndrome with huge varicosities, cross pelvic flow, and retrograde filling of the right gonadal. This is your regular dime a dozen patient. This patient would be identified by CTV if you did one. Now this is a patient that's pretty interesting because she was only 23 years old. She was diagnosed with celiac um, sensit or gluten sensitivity um, seven years prior. She's been on a gluten-free diet, never helped her with anything. If you can see this is a gonadal venogram and You can see that the, the, the catheter in the gonadal, the gonadal is not that large of a diameter. Her varicosities are not that significant. But if you look, you can see not just through the hypogastric lighting up through collaterals, but even the common femoral vein, the common iliac vein is lighting up. And there's a huge pancake uh, May Thurner lesion right here. So we embolized this patient. She got much better. We left, we actually did not stent her this time, even though she would have a, a higher recurrence, and this was discussed to her because of the chronic hypertension, um, because she was very young and she wanted to have children, and we discussed with her um, iliac stent deformity and, and whatnot from, from gestation. But this is your typical patient that we'll see that's post-congestive, and all of it, this would definitely be missed on CT venogram because she doesn't have a lot of 
a lot of uh, ovarian varicosity. She has mostly hypogastric, which can be you know, normal in a lot of cases. Um, so why I think the hypogastric collaterals are very important is they're large caliber, um, short length vessels with very low flow resistance. There's a huge amount of, of volume flow and accompanying pressure to a low flow gonadal system. So it's very easy. It's, it's kind of like perforator disease in deep venous insufficiency causing superficial disease. You don't need much. You just need localized segments and it causes a lot of symptoms. <clears throat> so this is another patient, not the best venogram in the world but basically shows a Maythurner lesion, everything backing up into the hypogastric. And we see this a lot in, in post-neurosurgical uh, post patients as well. And I think it's not a lot of data on this, it's hard to study, but it causes a piriformis syndrome type, type pain. And we have had good results with stending them and decompressing their, their uh, hypogastric system. I believe that's because their neurovascular bundle of all the the structures that pass through the piriformis in that sort of area, you know, you get a little bit of a chronic compartment syndrome. So this is another typical case that I'm talking about, this post-compressive in nature. Um, if you see, it, there's a very tight Maythurner lesion, a lot of post dilatation. This is something you don't see that often, but she has a very big retroperitoneal collateral and everything kind of backing up into the pelvis. And this is a typical patient that will prevent with that piriformis constellation. So I guess my, my end point here is, is pelvic, pelvic congestion syndrome is really a post-compressive disease. It can be temporary, uh, temporary compression, like with multiple gestations, which you read about in the literature. And it can also occur due to things like nutcracker syndrome and Maythurner or NIVLs, um, which basically causes a chronic, long-standing outflow resistance. Now for the venous circulation, you really only need small changes, and it happens over years. It doesn't really happen. Um, over a dramatic uh, time period. It's a chronic constrictive physiology. For Maythurner lesions, especially at the pelvic brim, we now know that you know, the bone spur at the pelvic, pelvic inlet is uh, pretty significant, especially when they have some degree of arterial insufficiency. And we just see this in a huge amount of patients that get worse over time um, because of that constant rubbing of the arterial pulsation on the pelvic brim. Um, with uh, Nutcracker syndrome, we see a lot of post-compressive um, congestion especially in males, it's, it's very commonly identified. Everybody hears about the, the tumors, but you know we see this in young males. The nutcracker syndrome usually presents in younger people. Interestingly enough, we see it a lot because we deal with a lot of post-bariatric patients, and when they lose that fat pad between their arteries and the veins, the nutcracker seems to be very, very prevalent in that patient population. Um, because of this, we routinely use intravascular ultrasound on every single evaluation of these patients, so we don't miss these lesions. Interestingly enough, we have noticed that when you have a right-sided shift um, of the venous structures, they tend to have this constellation of, of left-sided problems. They tend to have nutcracker syndrome, they tend to have Maythurner, and they have congestion. Everything becomes worse. I guess it's because it's a, a non-parallel distribution. <clears throat> so this is, this is that patient that I just, that I just showed the venogram of, with a very tight lesion, approximately 80%. And this is... Um, this is what it looked like. This was, this was another patient with, um, with a very, very small gonadal, as you can see, and significant amount of congestion. She was having terrible ovarian symptoms. So when we do, when we do our, our workup for these patients, because we we're not quite exactly sure what their symptoms are going to be, we, we take them to the operating room based on duplex and their symptoms. We do it with the patient awake. We don't sedate them at all. We, routine, we start a routine venogram, and once we identify the area that we think is causing the patient's pain, we show them on the screen, we talk to them about what it would be, whether it's their gluteal muscle, whether it would be their ovarian, um, whether it would sit on the bladder causing urinary symptoms, and we go through that with the patient, we verify, we try to reproduce the pain and we try to verify their symptoms and localize it based on the venogram. We discuss options at that time, um, including uh, treatment versus not treatment. Almost every patient wants to get treated at that time. Um, if they're hesitant or we're not 100% sure, we use gel foam, which is reversible, and we do not coil them. Um, at that same time, we identify any lesions that would look like this. Um, this obvious pancake lesion here for Maythurner syndrome, and we, just, and we basically uh, discuss that with them afterwards. So I believe our technique is more cost-effective. Um, 
certainly streamlines their process. We don't need a CT or MR. If the duplex is positive for hypogastric reflux or pelvic varicosities, which you'll see in, in leaner people, which are getting fewer and far between these days. Um, we do this patient under we do these patients under local so that you can involve them in the decision process and you can actually exactly act, uh, reproduce their pain, uh, which you will actually with a high um, contrast bolus to that area. Um, you won't miss any physiolog physiology because even if they have a small gonadal system, you'll catch all the cross collaterals, you'll catch all the pelvic flow. Um, it puts the treatment algorithm in your hands and not the hands of somebody that doesn't know about this disease, um, which is most people. Um, minimizes minimizes delay in treatment. So some people would argue, why don't you stent patients first if this is a post-compressive disease? Several reasons. I mean. Yes, our, our treatment um, cohort is going to be a lot larger. You don't want I personally I treat pe patients the way I would want to be treated. I wouldn't want a stent in me unless I was 100% sure that that was the, the cause of my problems. And we know from venous compression syndromes, not all of them are symptomatic regardless of how tight the lesions are. So, by embolizing somebody, it's an extremely low risk profile, especially if you don't use a coil. It's basically an analogous situation to people. We took a lot of this from the pain management world. You know, nobody gets really a facet ablation or, or something like that unless they have a diagnostic block first. So we look at, you know, gel foam embolization as kind of like a diagnostic block. We treat them first, we see if they get better. If they get better, we go along with definitive procedures. It leads to much higher patient satisfaction. They're much more involved in their process and they understand things properly. Um, at the end, um, compressive disease is treated based on severity of their symptoms and their and their, their where they are in life basically I and in our practice we don't stent people in um, unless their lesions are very symptomatic from a, an iliac lesion and they're finished with childbearing because of the stent deformability issues we also don't stent nutcrackers although we see a lot of them um, unless the kidneys threaten or the patient wants that um, and I tend to talk people more out of it because you can always retreat con congestion very easily um, and a migrated stent from a nutcracker which is you know, a known complication with legitimate uh, incidents, not something I would want happening to me. Um, so our technique is <clears throat> we never embolize, we always embolize the gonadals with, a, with, a, with basically a gel foam and a plug. We use, a, we use gel foam first, and then we use a, we use a, a terminal coil or some sort of similar uh, you know, coil on top of that, um, unless we're unless the patient is apprehensive about the treatment. For the, for the hypogastric symptom, uh, system, we don't use coils because most of the hypogastric reflux is significantly post-compressive and it will go away once you stent it. Um, we've also had two cases of coil migration and they were both from hypogastric systems. So it's a short caliber high pressure vessel that's closely related to the common iliac and uh, I just don't believe it, it really, um, helps the patient much. I think the stenting is going to help them more. So why we do things this way is I believe this disease is very, very common. Um, it's very, very underdiagnosed, has a very high satisfaction rate when treated, and has a very low risk of treatment. So in our practice, because we see a lot of people due to referral patterns with pelvic pain, we just use duplex as a, as a, as a screening to study. Um, although it's not, I mean, it's analogous to, to, to the duplex and, and angiogram with peripheral arterial disease. It's, it's not the, the best study in the world. It will give you a very high suspicion in the right technician's hands and the and astute physician with a good clinical history. Uh, patients with lower extremity symptoms that are severe in nature very often have a have a uh, higher correlation with pelvic disease as well, especially multi-paris ones. Um, there's a huge variety of symptoms that you can have from pelvic congestion based on the amount of organs and the close proximity of them, from anywhere from hip pain to gluteal pain to even you know, piriformis type symptoms. It's not really the specific you know, dyspareunia and vulvar varicosities that they talk about in the textbooks. <clears throat> to minimize recurrence, you will have recurrence if you don't, if you don't uh, stent compressive lesions. And even though we don't stent everybody, we discuss with them the risk of recurrence and ensure that they're, um, they know that that's a risk if they do not uh, treat their compressive disease. Um, the key takeaways from this practice, basically, for, for, key, for satisfaction purposes, 
we focus on what's causing the patient an issue, how to minimize their long-term effects, um, very common disease variants. Um, it's a very common disease with a lot of different presentations and very poor diagnostic yield without a venogram. So our, our, our MO is basically to get the patient to the venogram, keep them awake, inform them in the decision process, and give them open up diagnostic and treatment algorithms for them. It's always a post-compressive syndrome. In almost 100% of cases, it's either due to multiple gestations, which is compression on the iliac and the renal system, which is temporary but repetitive, versus um, an existing chronic constrictive uh, uh, con um, symptom, uh, chronic con constrictive physiology. So the only way to really get these patients into your system is to educate peers, talk to referral bases, which are gynecologists. We've seen a lot of these as fail as diagnosis of a, of a failed back syndrome after neurologic surgery. Interestingly enough, I've had two discectomies and I'm having a lot of piriformis problems on one side. I'm getting a venogram and I was tomorrow. So <laughs> like the hair club for men, I'm not just a, I'm not just speaking about it, I'm a patient. Um, and that's why I'm leaning on this, uh, this thing. So <laughs> as more and more studies have documented about the efficacy of this, the diagnostic yield, I think you're going to get a lot better a lot higher patient satisfaction, and I think there's a lot of people walking around with this that could benefit significantly. Um, I know I'm one of them, I think. All right, thanks, guys. Sorry, I was, had a lack of pictures, but uh, I just kind of got to So our, our technician, I mean, a, a great technician is key to this whole process. Our, our practice is a little weird. We have, we have, we deal with a lot of uh, reconstructive stuff for cancer. We deal with, we have neuro, neurologic uh, specialists on staff, and we also have the vascular specialist. So everybody gets a neuro workup, um, EMG, et cetera. Everybody gets, not a lot of people get MRIs. It's based, the, 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 the way you go down the pathway depends on their symptoms. If they have typical radicular symptoms, obviously we're not going to do this. If they have, you know, symptoms that get worse throughout the day, um, I'll talk about my symptoms, for instance. When I lay in bed at night, I'm fine. As soon as I get up in the morning, within 30 seconds, my leg is numb. I mean, I've had a discectomy. I mean, you have, you have to talk to these people. Like, we have a, a lot of these people have hardware in them. A lot of Harrington Rods patients, I see this bilaterally. Um, they get distal cable stenosis. People that have had multiple um, discectomies or, or fixations, they'll get this. And if you think about it, it's really a neurovascular bundle. It's not, there is no real, I noticed there's two neurosurgeons here speaking, and I, I kind of wanted to talk to them about this because I haven't in the past. But the nerves and the vasculature are always closely related. And I mean, if you have an inflammatory process, an extruded disc or something around there, I mean, you're, you're kidding yourself to think that nothing, everything doesn't get constricted in the same area. I think the nerves get affected first, followed by the veins, followed by the arteries. Um, so basically, it depends on the symptoms, and the symptoms will designate which pathway you go down. reference that with a quality of life outcome score at the end. Every single patient post-intervention gets one, whether it's stenting or embolization or both. They get one for each procedure. 
Um, so yes, we track everything. At one month, three months, six months, and a year. And that's that was that second slide that I put up. So about the um, vulnerability, medical legal issues, etc. When every patient gets an intervention because we don't know what we're going to do, we can send them for a venogram, possible embolization, possible intravascular ultrasound, possible stenting. I almost never stent anybody until they've gone through a whole long process. So you're doing the real consent before you get there, you just want them awake. To Correct. It, the, and them being awake is for two reasons. This is a very nebulous thing. I mean, a lot of physicians have uh, you know, a lot of trouble understanding it. I mean, the patient is no way going to understand this without seeing a screen. So. If you show them on their screen, and, and when, when you see it on the screen, you can actually, I mean, if you saw some of those venograms, some of it accumulates in the, in the buttock area, some of it accumulates in the, in the uterus, some of it on the bladder. When you when you can pinpoint stuff like that, I mean, women, women are very weird in general about talking about their pelvic pain. They just deal with stuff, and that's what they've been told to deal with their whole life. But if you actually can pinpoint it, they can be like, you know, yeah, I do have symptoms there, and yes, it does get worse when I stand throughout the day. And you can actually identify all the collaterals. Um, I had an interesting case about a lady that had anal incontinence with this. Um, I have some of the images if you guys want to see it. And she actually got better. She was on the schedule for some sort of spine stimulator for her, for her rectum, which I didn't know I was going to help her. I, I spoke to her in detail about this. I said, you know, I don't know if I can help you, but that other procedure sounds terrible. <laughs> and she, she actually went with this and, and did get better. She had a big vena venous malformation, like sitting right next to the rectum. Tighter the lesion, theoretically, the less chance. I mean, my worry is always the stent migration. A lot of people are, I think, overzealous about treating nutcracker, and it's not, especially in an older patient population. Um, if the kidney wasn't threatened by the time they're 40 years old, it's never going to be threatened, in, in my opinion. But so, yes, it, it just basically depends on how severe the lesion is and how, how bad you think it is. If their right gonadal has no disease, their left is huge, and they're having a lot of symptoms, yes, I would, I would treat that. Yeah, I mean, for instance, I've had a couple. In both those patients, I told them, look, you can treat it all at once, or you can 
try what might work and minimize your procedures and minimize the risks of stenting in the future. Both patients elected for that first option. Both patients got stented afterwards. I, I, I'm a big fan of involving the patient. It, it, I think it depends on your referral pattern. If you're a tertiary referral 